First of all, thanks for the organizers for this uh, opportunity uh, to discuss the quaconium measurements from Rick Starr. And as uh, Subash mentioned, my name is Ron Roma. I'm from Brookhaven National Lab. So I think for this uh, audience, and um, we um, here, we are in the heavy eye on uh, FedEx. So I just very briefly uh, uh, to a, a introduction to the, the so-called quaconium plasma. That's the main subject of research in, in this field. So this quaconium plasma is a special uh, state of uh, QCD matter. And the, um, the novelty of this matter is that instead of uh, ordinarily uh, confined uh, uh, qu um, gluons and quarks in the nuclear uh, nucleons, so these quarks and gluons are um, almost free moving uh, in this special state of matter. So on, so here you can see on the left-hand side, this is like the ordinary nu uh, nuclear matter. You have the uh, three quarks confined in a nucleon. On the, on the right-hand side, usually people uh, call this a soup of uh, a quark gluon plasma. And here you can, the quarks and the gluons are moving almost freely. And this is a special state of matter, which uh, is believed to have existed at the early universe. So that's uh, kind of the one of the motivation why we want to study how the properties of the uh, this quark gluon plasma and how this involves, which can help or put a private input to the uh, universe. Um, to the theory of starting the uh, universe evolution. So I think this is a very nice idea. And then, of course, the next question is, uh, how do we uh, start this? Uh, we cannot travel back 13 billion years uh, to, to the start of the Big Bang. So we're trying to uh, create little bands in, in the lab to, uh, to recreate create this state of um, matter. So this is where the uh, the heavy ion collisions come in. So this kind of the original idea or sort of hinted in 1974 by T.D. Lee that uh, we should investigate the phenomena by distributing high energy or high nuclear density over a relatively large volume. So here, I think this is relatively large volume is a key. Uh, that's why uh, we want to look at the uh, large nucleus like a gold, gold, gold at a rick or lead at the OHC. So this is kind of the... Um, a uh, bird view of the Rick complex on the left hand side. Uh, so this is the Rick ring shown as the uh, yellow and the blue. And uh, uh, currently, we only have one running experiment, which is called STAR, and which uh, which is what I will be focusing on. And uh, starting in May this year, we have a new uh, a, a new detector called S Phoenix, uh, which uh, will be actually focusing on the uh, jets and uh, and quaconium measurements. On the right hand side is the LHC, which uh, the main program, of course, is the proton proton looking at, for example, Higgs and the beyond standard model of physics. Uh, uh, they also run heavy ions, I think, about a month a year. And there is a, a delicate uh, an, an experiment called ELISE, uh, which is designed to study the heavy ion uh, collisions. And of course, the other uh, four, uh, three major experiments like CMS Alice or LHCB. They also have a program uh, for the heavy ion, even though, I mean, the number per manpower there is much smaller compared to Elise. So uh, here we have a idea. We use heavy ion uh, collisions in a lab to recreate the quantum clone plasma. Then, um, so then the quest next question, of course, is how do we study that? So usually quantum clone plasma leaves only a, like a few tens of Fermi over C, which is very fast. There's no way uh, we can um, uh, insert a external probe to start is a property, like you do say condensed matter, you can shoot a laser to the material. Here we cannot do that. What we can do is to uh, study the uh, the properties of what we call the probes created also in the uh, in, in the uh, in the collision to start uh, to uh, study the properties of the quantum gluon plasma. So one of such probe is so-called the quaconium. So before I go there, I just have a brief introduction. What is a quaconium? So it is a meson. It's made up of a pair of heavy quark and anti, and it's anti-quark. So it's made of two quarks. That's why it's called a meson. So there are two types of quaconium. One is called a J-Si, which is made up of a charm and anti-charm. So uh, in particularly, uh, this, uh, the J-Si, as you probably, uh, a lot of you know, it was discovered in 1974 at both Slack and Brookhaven. So this is, um, so it was discovered at AGS at Brookhaven and AGS is actually still used as one, as part of the uh, RIC complex. I think this is kind of very closely related to our field. 
Uh, of course, uh, in, 1990, in 1977, the, uh, the Upstone, which is an, another type of quarkonium, uh, it's made of a, a, a bottom quark and anti-bottom quark, which was discovered in Fermilab. So throughout this uh, talk, I will mainly discuss uh, how we use the JSI and the Upstron to study the uh, properties of the, uh, of the QGP. And, and next uh, uh, natural question is why quarkonium? Why do we want to study their, uh, their kind of uh, behavior in the QGP? So um, uh, quarkonium, as uh, I just mentioned, they are made of heavy quark and anti-quark. Heavy means their mass is large. So because you, the mass is large, you mean, means you need a lot of energy to create them. So that means they are mostly created very early in the collision, even before the QGP is formed. So therefore, they can experience the entire evolution of the QGP. Uh, of course, uh, this is a curse and, and also a challenge and an opportunity. Um, one can argue that because you experience so, so many phases of the, of the uh, fireball, and all the effect you measure in the end, I think um, is average everything. So it's probably not so easy uh, to uh, disentangle different uh, properties. On the other hand side, you can also argue that you, you probably need to get everything right to, to explain all the data we have. So I think that's, that, that's kind of true probably for all the hard probes. And that's something you should keep in mind. And of course, uh, then uh, uh, the other uh, biggest uh, kind of the motivation of starting the quaconium, starting uh, this is the idea from 1986 about using the quaconium as a evidence uh, of, uh, of the confinement, as I said earlier. So the, a, the defining feature of the quaconium plasma is the quarks and gluons in the site QGP are def deconfined. Then how do we know they are deconfined? So this is the idea uh, uh, of if you say, for example, you have a J site, which is made of a charm and anti-charm in a vacuum. Here you can see there is a potential between the charm and anti-charm, which hold the, uh, the, the, the meson together. If you start to put the JSI, for example, in a medium, when the medium temperature is, is, uh, is low, the, uh, the Debye uh, the, the length of the medium, which is all, you can think of this of like a typical resolution um, of the medium. If the resolution is actually larger or, or the resolution length is larger than the size of the JSI, uh, then the, the, the medium could not see what's inside of the JSI, it just see the JSI as a whole. And then the JSI can remain intact in the, while going through the medium. However, if the, uh, the, if the temperature of the medium goes uh, higher, uh, or in other words, if the, if the resolution lens becomes smaller than the JSI, it can actually get uh, to see what's inside of the JSI and get into the JSI. Uh, if that happens, uh, these uh, quarks and gluons can screen the potential between charm and anti-charm and uh, dissociate this, uh, the, the JSI. So experimentally, what you will see is a kind of the suppression of the JSI yields, which is why it was proposed as a direct proof of the QGP formation, or in other words, is a proof of the kind of the deconfinement. So th this kind of the picture is what we usually we call the, the static dissociation, meaning if you have put a JSI kind of in sta uh, statically in a, in a static medium, sorry, in a static medium, this is the, um, the, uh, the color screening effect. So here, so this is the uh, the the color screening color screening effect. Where when it happens when the radius of the uh, quaconium, which is anti-proportional uh, uh, to the uh, uh, to the binding energy, when it becomes larger than the than the Debye uh, length, which is also inverse proportional to the temperature. So here, okay, immediately you can see that the screening is depends on temperature. So one can put kind of push this idea of this uh, dissociation a bit further. If you, if you think about this, if you have a different uh, quaconium, which have different uh, uh, binding energies, for example, you can have like the JSI and the uh, Psi2S, which is the excited state of the char of the charmonium, and they have a different binding energy here. Or you can have also have three different uh, upstone states from the uh, BB bar uh, family, and they also have very different binding energies. You can imagine that this, uh, because this quaconium uh, quaconia have uh, different binding energies. Uh, binding energies. Uh, they are expected to di dissociate at a very different temperature. So if I can uh, kind of measure uh, the suppression patterns of all these quaconium, which we should call the sequential suppression, 
uh, meaning the more uh, kind of the loosely bounded, for example, three to, uh, upsilon three S state is more likely to be dissociated in the uh, in the uh, QGP compared to, for example, upsilon Y S, which have a much higher uh, binding energy. If we can measure this quantum suppression, we might be able to kind of infer the temperature of the QGP. That's we kind of um, starting from a, a evidence of the QG formation to one step further to trying to study the, the properties of the QGP. That's essentially the final goal of the field. We really want to figure out how the QGP behave. So I think these ideas are very nice, but of course, over the years, uh, we realized there are actually many uh, complications to the quaternion measurements, which kind of make it uh, quite complicated to interpret the results. So I just list some of the complications we kind of re realized over the years. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the, that picture was, this is color screening picture is so-called the, the static dissociation. So there's also the so-called dynamic uh, dynamics dissociation, which refers to the scattering between the uh, quark and gluon, uh, quarks and gluons with the um, uh, quarkonium. So on the left-hand side, this is a, like a leading order uh, diagram. Here you can have a quaternium come in, absorb a, a, a gluon and split or dissociate into a BB bar. Or you can also have like a next to linear order processes like you have, have a scattering between a, a quark and the quaternium or the gluon and the quaternium. And then the, the end product will be, uh, again, the quaternium is dissociated. So this also happens. Of course, they also have, if you have a higher temperature, this happens, this dynamic dissociation also happens uh, faster or uh, more frequently. So in that sense, it's also somewhat related temperature, but I think the kind of its connection to the temperature is much less direct compared to the uh, static dissociation. There's also a counter process, which is called a regeneration. So the idea is if you have a, in the quark plasma, if you have a lot of, for example, charm and anti-charms are throwing around, when they, then when they are close to each other in the phase space, they can recombine to make a J side. So for example, if, here I put you, I give you like the number of CC bar per event in essential uh, heavy ion collisions. For example, at the uh, Ricky energy is about 10 pairs and LC is about 100 pairs. So you have so many charm and anti-charms uh, flying around and there is a, uh, a significant chance they can recombine to regenerate J side. As you can see, this kind of act against the dissoci dissociation signal we are looking for. Uh, of course, on the other hand side, you can also think about this as another uh, evidence or uh, proof of the deconfinement, because if you want to have regeneration, you need to start with the deconfined charm and anti, sorry, uh, anti-charm, which by itself, uh, it already means uh, the, the, the medium is deconfined. So I think this is also, um, it's again, this is a curse and also an opportunity uh, the regeneration, as I said, so it depends on how many uh, charm and anti-charm quarks you have in the medium. So which uh, also depends on uh, if we are looking at the charm on the bottom or the uh, collision energy or the PT you are looking at. So they have a very distinct uh, dependence on different kinematics. There's also so-called uh, the medium induced energy loss. So the idea is uh, uh, as you go to high and higher PT, those uh, quaternium, for example, JSI, may come in from the gluon uh, frag uh, fragmentation. And those gluons can already lose energy in the QGP, like jet quenching, before they fragment into j side. So that's another kind of uh, complication when we uh, start to try to uh, int uh, interpret the results, at, especially at high PT. Then we have the so-called formation time effect. The idea is if you, the high PT um, uh, hadrons or high PT j side, for example, they can fly out of the medium faster because they have a higher PT and they might less um, have less interaction with the medium. So uh, in terms of suppression, they may have less suppression compared to say low PT, uh, uh, low PTJ side. And in the end, I think we also have a very complicated feed down uh, uh, contributions or feed down structures. So on the right hand side, this is the, uh, just maybe just look at this one as example. This is the, uh, the composition of the optional 1S at the uh, at low PT at the, uh, at the LC. So this is uh, uh, about 70% are the directly, um, 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 sorry, directly uh, produced the optional 1S and all the other from the higher states feed down. So uh, because uh, what we usually measure experimentally is a inclusive, for example, inclusive JSI or inclu inclusive optional 1S. 
there's uh, no way experimentally we can uh, distinguish between uh, directly produced JSI or JSI from a higher state of feed down. So because of that, uh, we need to, when we interpret, for example, the results for the uh, inclusive JSI, we need to take into account the suppression of the highest higher states, or let's say psi prime or chi C, which uh, uh, expect to be a suppressor more compared to JSI. I think this is also something we need to keep in mind, and that's the com also the complication we have when we interpret the uh, the quaternion results. With all of this, this is already sounds quite complicated, I know. Uh, but uh, what makes things even worse is we also have the so-called the cold nuclear matter effects. Uh, the idea. Uh, so here. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, what the signal we're looking for is a, a modification to the quaternion uh, yields or production uh, production rates. Uh, we also expect to see a modification to the particle production uh, just uh, due to the presence of a nucleus. It's not uh, because we have a nucleus nucleus collision. It's not really related to the creation of the QGP, which is what the effect we're after. So they are, so in the heavy ion collisions, there might be two effects we see. One is because of the QGP effects. The other one is so is because of the uh, the nucleus. So usually, what we do is we we measure uh, this, uh, this uh, particle production in proton uh, uh, proton um, nuclear cl uh, collisions, where in the PA collisions so we don't expect to see a large volume QGP, or in other words, the QGP effect is expected to be small. So uh, the effect we see in the PA, uh, in the proton nucleus collision is, we think there are many from this uh, so-called cold nuclear matter effect. So there are, there are different things. So I just have this here. Here I have a diagram. You have, for example, a proton and a nucleus coming in. They, for example, they uh, uh, radiate a gluon, and then one of the gluon uh, can uh, split into QQ bar and um, uh, and create a JSI, and the JSI flies out. So in this process, there are um, there are uh, in each step there are some modifications in the process compared to, for example, the PP case. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at the initial uh, the uh, the uh, proton distribution function in the nucleus. And on the right hand side, this is the proton distribution function in a lead compared to a free proton. And you can see at small x, we see a suppression, uh, which uh, we used to call this a shadowing. And in the intermediate uh, mass uh, x range, we see the anti shadowing, meaning the, uh, the proton distribution function in a nucleus is actually uh, higher compared to that in a free nucleon. So this kind of change in the proton distribution function. Uh, can also uh, can contribute to a modification to the par uh, particle production in uh, when you have a nucleus. Moving on, when the uh, before the gluon kind of they scatter, the gluon also need to go through the what is the cold nuclear nuclear matter in the nucleus, and they can have some uh, energy loss because of the, uh, the the medium induced radiation or the scattering process, and this also change kind of your uh, the, your kinematics of the uh, of the hard scattering. So after the JSI is um, is formed, it also goes through the nucleus again, and then it can interact with the, with the nucleus without uh, nucleons with, within the nucleus, and it can break up. This is what we call the nuclear absorption, and this is more kind of uh, the effect actually uh, increases as you go down in the clinical energy, because you can think about this at the LHC, because the, the incoming nucleus is more like a pancakes. The, the JSI does not have much time to interact with the nucleons in them. So this uh, nuclear absorption is uh, effect is small, but at the rig or at the even lower energy at the SPS, and the effect is much bigger because you're, you have more time to interact. So in the end, is what we, uh, people used to call is a cold mover absorption, meaning if you have a JSI or more like a very loosely bounded uh, uh, state like psi prime or upsilon 3s, they can interact with this uh, Sorry, uh, the, the the other fine state particles flying along the way, and then they can also these uh, kind of interactions uh, can also break up uh, break up the quaternion. So all of these, I think you can see, they have nothing to do with the QGP, but they can also modify your uh, quaternion production compared to the proton proton case. So that's why we also need to kind of uh, be good very experimentally. We can kind of uh, constrain or quantify. Uh, the uh, cold nuclear matter effect before, which can uh, feed into our interpretation of the results in AA collisions. Then I uh, just a few kind of uh, 
a simple lecture type of uh, the uh, uh, the slides. So then the next question is, so we, we've talked so much why, why we want to use quaconium to start a QGP and all the complications. Then when it comes to experimental measurements, the, the first question you ask is how do you actually measure quaconium? So in all the, all the experiments, probably you will listen here today or maybe in the next few weeks, um, I think people all use the so-called invariant mass method. This is to look at the, uh, the decay daughters either from the uh, dielectron channel, meaning the JSI, for example, decays into two uh, E plus E minus, or the dimuon channel, the mu plus mu minus pairs. So if you can reconstruct the invariant mass, which is M squared, which is the P, uh, P1, which is the full momentum of the one daughter, plus P2, which is the full momentum of the other daughter, you can sum them up and take a square, and this is what do you end up with is the two times uh, the m square, which is uh, the mass of the lepton, and then the energy uh, and the uh, three uh, momentum vector of the the the, the uh, daughter pairs. So this is essentially how we kind of the measure the uh, quaconium. And what you will see is on the on this figure, this is the invariant mass of the mu plus and mu minus pair, and you can see this is the prompt kind of a JSI peak, which is uh, the peak value is about 3.1, which is the JSI mass. Of course, you will ask, so why don't we just see, uh, all, why do we see a width here? So you know, the meaning, um, we sometimes we reconstruct the mass around 3 GeV, sometimes at 3.2 GeV. So that's mainly due to the uh, experimental resolution. That means that if I give you a 1 GeV track, sometimes you, uh, the experimenter tells me it's 0.9, sometimes tell me it's 1.1, 1 .1. it's never exactly at 1. So that's the resolution effect. But here you can see you have a clear kind of a JSI pick, which you can fit and get to the JSI yield. That's essentially how people uh, measure JSI experimentally. So here you can immediately, we essentially need two things to do a quaconium measurement. Well, first of all, you need a particle momentum. So here, this is the energy and the momentum as an uh, enter this invariant mass. The other one is you need a particle species, which that, it does not directly enter here, <clears throat> but you need to uh, know is here, you need to identify your, your electrons and the muons in order to kind of have a good uh, signal to background ratio. So with this in, uh, in mind, then we can go to STAR. So the, that's what I will be focusing on today. So uh, the, the, the full name of STAR is the solenoid tracker at the RIC. It's, uh, this is kind of the schematic uh, um, picture of STAR. So it's a kind of the mid rapidity detector. And at the center of STAR is a so-called time projection chamber, which is our match, uh, main tracker. It's used to measure the track momentum. As I said earlier, that's one thing we need for the quaconium measurement. And also can uh, the TBC can also uh, measure the energy loss of the particles when they go through the gas in the TBC. And with, uh, with this energy loss, we can also uh, can be used to identify uh, electrons or muons. Then we uh, for the electron channel, we use the barrel, uh, it's barrel meaning it's in the middle uh, and the electromagnetic calorimeter which can be used uh, to trigger and also identify high PT electrons. Again, here, it's used for, uh, for PID or particle identification of the electrons. We also have the, the so-called muon telescope detector, which can uh, be used to trigger and identify muons. So this is used for the muon channel. So here I, I mentioned the word trigger a few times. The reason you need trigger is quaconium are very are rare probes, meaning they only, um, uh, they are only produced very rarely, like once every, I don't know, thousands or millions, uh, thousands or tens of thousands uh, events. So of course, you don't want to take all of those because most of them are in are uninteresting. So we want to uh, be able to uh, to look at the signal, uh, the quaconium signal, and to trigger on the events that we are uh, we are uh, interested in and, and, and analyze them. This is a much more efficient. Uh, so that's why I mentioned the trigger a few times. So going into the detail and uh, the muon telescope detector, which is our main kind of uh, device for the muon channel. Uh, so MTD was uh, in fully installed in 2014. So this is kind of one of the recent upgrades from STAR. So on the so here, I just shows you a kind of the geometric uh, figure of the MTD. And here you can see, and uh, you can, so uh, on each row, you have either five, we call them five trays, or on the bottom, we have three trays. And that's because of the uh, physical constraints. 
And on the right hand side is uh, is the picture of the MTD. Here you see the one, two, three. These are the trays which correspond to these guys here on the left hand side. So this is located outside of the star magnets. And uh, so on the previous slide, so the, the the blue here is essentially these are star magnets, and the uh, the white uh, kind of the stuff here. This is the the MTD. So here, the star magnets is acting as an absorber uh, to other hadrons. So this is a kind of a technique you see all the time when you look at when you uh, when you have a muon detector. Meaning you usually put a lot of heavy stuff in, in front of the muon detector to uh, to stop all these hadrons like pions, kaons, and protons. That's actually the major way to kind of separate the hadrons and the uh, and the muons. So in star, because as I said, MTD was uh, installed quite late in the project. So we we don't really have any space to install specific or um, uh, specific like absorbers for MTT. So we essentially just use what we have, which is the magnets, which is also quite heavy. So it sits about 400 centimeters radially from the center of the star and covers about uh, eight or less than 0.5 at a meter rapidity and about 45% in phi. So we don't really have the full phi coverage. You can see you have, we have gaps and we have, again, on the bottom, we only have three trays uh, instead of five trays because of uh, there's no just no space. We, we can install that many trays. So in, uh, in total, we have 122 trays and uh, we have 1,400 readout strips. I will talk a bit more about the readout strips in, on the next slide. <clears throat> the technology used by the MTD is a so-called uh, multi-gap resistive uh, plate chambers. So on the right-hand side, so this is a schematic view of a MRPC. So uh, multi-gap refers to that, the, case, the fact that we have one, two, three, four, for example, a few gaps here. So, and then uh, out of the gap, these are resistive plates, meaning the, 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 the electrons cannot go through them. And you should, sometimes you can use gas, uh, glass as a resistive plate. And within the plate, you have the a gap and where we put on gas. So in STAR, we use 55% of Freon and 4.5% isobutane and 0.5% SF6. So the idea is when you have a particle, um, say a muon going through the, uh, the, the detector, <clears throat> it can ionize uh, the gas within each gap. It could be here or could be here. So the reason you use multiple gaps is to increase the uh, efficiency of the detection. So because you have multiple chance to, uh, to um, ionize the gas. Once you have the, the gas ionized, you have the, uh, the, uh, the electrons which will drift um, because there is an electric field uh, applied here. And through the drifting, these uh, electrons will, uh, will ionize more gas, uh, gas atoms and create more electrons. This is what we call the avalanche mode. And uh, so we want to control, of course, we want to control the size of the or avalanche, which is actually why we use isobutane and SF6 to, to achieve good precision. So this is the kind of the main kind of the idea behind the technique. And the, uh, of course, one of the advantage of this uh, MRPC is that you can uh, uh, produce them in a large scale, cover a large area, and it's, uh, it's relatively cheap compared to, for example, silicon, uh, uh, det uh, silicon detectors. So the other thing, uh, inter uh, another unique thing about MTD is we use a so-called uh, a double end readout. So once you have the, for example, these are the readout strips, or here you can, these are the readout strips. If you have a signal hitting here, for example, then they uh, then you will uh, we have readout on both sides, and the, what we collect is a timing. So when the signal uh, arrives at this side, which we call it T1, and the signal on the other hand side we call it T2. If you take the difference between T1 and T2, you can figure out the position of this signal along this direction. And if you take the sum of the T1 and T2, you can figure out the time when the, um, when the, uh, when the, when the uh, signal hits or the particle hits the uh, detector. So these are the two main measurements we can get from MTD. One is the position. Uh, the intrinsic resolution is about one to two centimeter, which is not great. But I mean, this given the price you pay, I think that's uh, good enough. And then also the uh, timing resolution about 100 picosecond. So then a bit more about the PID, as I said earlier, um, we get all the momentum information from TBC, then we get all the kind of the PID and the trigger information from MTD for the muon channel. So again, this is based on the position and the timing information from MTD. So on the left-hand side, this is the timing of the, uh, 
the flight time of a particle for a muon show as a red and for a hadron show as a, a, a blue. Here you can see there's a distinctly a, a difference. You can cut on, uh, for example, the less than 0.5 to select most of the muons while reject a, fr a large fraction of the hadrons. Uh, in the middle and on right hand side, these are the position, sorry. These are the position measurements uh, for the muons again show as red here and for the hadron show as uh, blue. So again, you can cut on the, the muon pick and reject some of the hadrons. So this, uh, this is also, again, this is the main idea of the PID. Whenever you do a PID, you want to make sure your, your particle of interest have a different distribution compared to the background. Then you can uh, place cut to select a signal and reject a, 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 a fraction of the background. Here you can see no matter what kind of cut you, you apply, you, can still, you still have some uh, blue left. Which is okay. So this is a but by applying this cut, we can already suppress the background more compared to the signal. That's usually the case. You will, it's rarely you can suppress all the background. That we just because the background is always overlaps with the signal in some way. Even though the, as long as I have a different distribution, you can uh, place a cut to suppress the background. So for the trigger, so uh, the uh, the MTD using the so-called the, the dimuon trigger. So the process we are triggering on is either J psi or upsilon um, uh, decaying to the mu plus and mu minus. The trigger condition is uh, you need at least the two signals in the MTD uh, or the two signal, meaning the two uh, mu on candidates in the MTD based on the timing. The idea is that MTD gives me uh, the arrive time. I, we have a di uh, independent detected star to give me the, uh, the star time or the, uh, the collision time. So by if you take the time difference between the two, you can figure out the the the, uh, the flight time of the of the particle from the center to the MTD, and then you can calculate a, a kind of theoretically how much time it should take a muon to fly from the center to the MTD, and then you can apply a cut on the on the, what your measurement with respect to your expectation, and that's how we select the muon candidates. So uh, one uh, very uh, good uh, feature about the MTD is it can trigger on the quaconium, even the JSI down to zero PT, which is quite interesting, especially for the JSI measurement. And because star uh, before MTD, we can only measure uh, low PT JSI using mean bias events, which have a much less uh, rates or the uh, the uh, to or much less luminosity to make such measurement. The rejection power is about one to thirty, so we select one event out of thirty events. Uh, from the dimuon trigger again, still it's still very much dominated by background, unfortunately. But uh, that's what we have, and the, those MTD triggering events are saved as star in a delicate uh, different file stream, so it will be much easier for people to analyze them later on. Then we go to the electron channel. So these are the uh, electron magnetic magnetic calorimeter on the left hand side. This is a kind of the cross section. A cross section of view. So uh, basically, you look at it in uh, 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 start on uh, from the side. So the, uh, in the middle, these are the TPC again, and uh, these kind of the open boxes you can see here. So these are where the uh, uh, EMC or electromagnetic calorimeter sits. So on the right hand side is a side view. Again, these are the TPC, and this is the where the uh, um, uh, BMC sits here. So it covers about the eight or less than one point zero and a five between zero to two pi. So essentially have the same uh, coverage at the TPC, which is great. So we can fully utilize the um, momentum measurement from TPC for quaconium. For, for quaconium. And the, uh, the front end of the BMC uh, is about 220 centimeters away from the, uh, from the center. So essentially the, the uh, BMC is with the inside of the magnets and MTD is outside of the magnets. It uh, has about 4,800 towers. Each of the tower uh, cover about uh, about in 805, 0.05. Then in terms of the uh, technology, it'll use uh, this classic uh, lead scintillator sampling calorimeter. So the idea is you can have, you have uh, 20 layers of lead. So what's shown here. So this kind of the strips here, these are dark color strips. These are lead uh, layer. And we have 21 layers of scintillator, which is the light color strips here. So these are the scintillators. So here, the idea is the lead is used as an absorber, meaning if you have a particle coming in, <clears throat> we'll lose a majority of the energy in the lead. And the scintillator is used as the active volume. So for the energy lost in the scintillator by the particle, 
it will uh, those energy will be collected and be used uh, for energy measurement. So the reason it's called a sampling because only a fraction of the energy are deposited in the scintillator and collected and measured. So the uh, as you can see, uh, the uh, the main measurement provided by the uh, BMC is the energy measurement, and here this is the typical or the nominal uh, resolution for star, and you can see it's about fifteen. Uh, percent divided by square root of E uh, is the energy of the particle. And you can see at higher energy, the uh, resolution will be better. And uh, because of the, uh, the uh, as I said earlier, so this, uh, the tower, uh, the uh, granularity is very, uh, is uh, coarse. So we, the position resolution is actually quite uh, bad. So we have this so-called shower max detector, which is kind of embedded in these uh, layers of the large and the scintillator. So this is uh, where the shower uh, the the maximum shower occur and they have a much finer special resolution about uh, on the millimeter level and this is very critical for uh, if you want to separate or distinguish between say a photon and a by zero of course this is not used in this analysis but this is also a, a feature of the uh, BMC detected star which is also used for a lot of photon measurement about the PID and the trigger, again, so for the PID, as I said before, so the, it's mainly based on the energy deposition. So the idea is uh, we use the uh, variable called E over P. So E is the energy measured in the BMC. P is the momentum measured in the TPC. So for the electrons, uh, it will go through the elect uh, electromagnetic shower and it will deposit most of the energy or the full energy in the BMC. And we expect the E over P will be close to one. On the other hand side, for the hadrons, it just goes through the ionization process. So it will only will deposit much less energy compared to the electrons. So in the lower hand, lower plot is a comparison. It's E0 over P for the uh, electrons show as red and for the pions show as uh, black. Here you can see if you cut on say between 0.5 and 1.5, you can select most of the electrons while you reject a large fraction of the hadrons. So I think that's a, a one way, that's the main, main approach we use uh, with the BMC to the PID. So on the right-hand side, this is the trigger. We should, as I said earlier, we want to trigger on this qualconium because they are produced very rare, rarely. Uh, so it can be based on a single tower, what we call high tower trigger. This is a basically on to trigger on a single electron or the photon or a cluster of towers, usually, which is usually used for jet measurements, which is not used here. As I mentioned, so the quaconium is based on a single tower above a third threshold. For the result I'm going to show later, it's a th the threshold is about 3.5 GeV for the optional measurement. And uh, we also require either one or both of the quaconium dollars or uh, electrons to defy the trigger such that you can, uh, you can correctly as assess the trigger bias. So with all of this in mind, so I just have a quick comparison. So we, at STAR, we can measure quaconium uh, you are using both the electron, um, the muon channel with the MTD and the electron uh, uh, use the BMC. So the, in terms of the PID, the MTD, uh, the MTD is time in a position and the BMC based on the energy and the position. For the kinematics, the MTD can go down to zero and the BMC is usually for high PD JSI, but the optional can also go down to zero. So this is, I think this is a kind of advantage of the MTD and the advantage of the BMC or the electron channel is have much bigger acceptance. So here is the, the, the acceptance is almost a factor of four larger compared to MTD for a single track. If you compare quaconium, which is two tracks, it's almost a factor of 16 larger. Of course, the biggest kind of advantage of the MTD is, um, is using the muons. So the Bramstrom law is much less compared to electrons. So what I'm showing here, this is the upsilon measurement we are start just published early this year based on the uh the muon channel this is the invariant mass with optional ys and 2s and for the electron channel this is ys and 2s so before i go to the actual uh, results i just a few words about about some uh, uh uh kind of the general idea what is that we usually use centrality to quantify the what do we call the collision geometry or the impact parameter what do we call central events meaning you have a small impact parameter and you and you have a large overlap area, so you are you can create a larger and hotter medium. On the other side, when we call the peripheral, it meaning you have a large impact parameter, the overlap is small. You can have a smaller and a less uh, 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 less dense medium. We also use the so-called nuclear modification factor RAA to uh, quantify the modification uh, to the particle production by the QGP. 
So the IAA is essentially a yield in the AA compared to the yield or take the ratio to the yield in PP. And you scale by the so-called number of binary conditions to take out the, uh, the, the trivial effect that there are simply more uh, 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 nucleon, 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 nucleon conditions in, in heavy ions compared to PP. So usually when you see RIA is less than one, we say there is a suppression, which is uh, the signal we're looking for, uh, for, uh, for the qualconium. And usually if you see a RIA larger than one, we say there's an enhancement. So going into the actual results, so we will uh, talk about the, we started with the cold nuclear matter effects. So this is uh, the uh, latest measurement from STAR. And this is uh, looking at the JSI uh, RPA. As I said earlier, we measure these, me these particles in proton nucleus collisions to quantify the so-called nuclear matter effect. So on the left-hand side, so this RPA as a function PT for JSI is shown as the red data points here. This is the latest STAR measurement and it can compare to the D gold measurement in Phoenix so as a, a, a black open circles here. As you can see at a low PT, we see about 30% uh, suppression and above two to three GV, you can see the RPA is consistent with one, which means that the cold nuclear matter effects is, get, is actually quite small at a high PT. So on the right-hand side, we can uh, compare our measurement to different model calculations. Uh, as said earlier, there are many different ways you can uh, modify a, the yield at a PA, um, which is not necessarily related to the quantum Coulomb plasma. For example, you can have um, the, uh, the, uh, the MPDF effects, the change in the nuclear modific, uh, sorry, the change to the proton distribution function. So that's essentially what you see at this kind of the yellowish uh, distributions. These are the, uh, the effect of the, of the um, proton distribution function. We can also have energy loss effect, as I said earlier, which is shown as this uh, magenta line. There's also a co-mover uh, kind of uh, a prediction shown as a dashed line, where you can see that uh, the prediction is much, uh, it's kind of a two, I think more than two sigma wave from, from the data at high PT. So you can see that the data are consistent with different model calculations, which um, not necessarily good. And that means that we cannot really distinguish in different mechanisms. The only thing we can see here is the high PT, the uh, dissociate, uh, the commover uh, model is probably uh, um, uh, is too too low compared to data. Then we can also we can also measure the optional RPA uh, at a 200 GeV. This is the RPA as a function of PTT this time. So there's three red uh, stars here. These are latest star measurement from PA. And here you can see uh, they're, uh, they're, all the three data points are below one. If you put them together, it's about 20% suppression, even though the error bar is still uh, very big. So it's probably about less than two sigma effect uh, compared to one. Uh, we can also compare these results to, for example, nuclear PDF calculations shown as this uh, shaded, uh, the, the hatched area here. So here you can see actually now the uh, in uh, nuclear PDF, actually, the, uh, the prediction is above one, meaning we are in the anti-shadowing region. But of course, there, but the data seems to uh, indicate there is some suppression needed. If you look at it, for example, energy loss alone, you can see it's getting closer to the data. So there is, uh, seems to be some suppression mechanism needed. That's uh, theoretically, but experimentally, we also, I think what we can learn from here is that there is some uh, uh, optional suppression in because of the cold nuclear matter effect. Then we go to the so-called hot nuclear matter effect, meaning we have a, when we have a QGP. So this is the star measurement of the JSI RAA at the function PT in different centrality beams. So we can just focus on the, uh, 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 the central collisions, for example, zero to 20% of the star measurement is shown as the red stars here. You can see the JSI suppress from zero to all the way up to 15 GV. And uh, we don't really see a strong PT dependence. And uh, so this could be an interplay of different effects. I mentioned at the very beginning, for example, the dissociation uh, effect, we expect this uh, effect to decrease with PT because the, this formation time effect, the higher PTJ side can fly out of the medium uh, faster. Uh, also, there might be regeneration, which is mostly at a low PT. And the cold nuclear matter effect, as I said earlier, I've show, I've just shown, it's also you see a suppression at low PT and high PT, we don't see that. And also you might have uh, the, the B hatch on feet down because what we measure here are the inclusive JSI, not prompt JSI. You might have the uh, feet down from the um, bottom hadrons at high PT. So all of these kind of effects together, you uh, result in this kind of the rather kind of insignificant PT dependence. 
And we can also compare to different transport and energy loss models. We have two transport models from Tsinghua and Texas AM. So as the kind of the black hatch and the, the magenta line here, and uh, we also have some energy loss correction, uh, sorry, energy loss calculations show as the, uh, uh, the, the solid bands here. It's probably uh, hard to see. They only show at high PT and all of these models seem to uh, agree with data reasonably well. And um, uh, nevertheless, I think with the conclusion we can see here is that at high PT, we see RA is about 0.4. And because at high PT, the, uh, the cold nuclear matter becomes uh, 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 minimal. So this is a clear um, kind of the uh, evidence that we do see a dissociation at high PT uh, for the high PT JSI. Then we can compare uh, our result to, to RIC. So this is the JSI RAA as a function of centrality. Uh, the, the star data show as red and the at least data show as blue. Here you can see quite interestingly, because naively one would think once you go to the LHC, because the medium is hotter, uh, because uh, due to the larger collision energy, you expect to see a bigger a JSI suppression. Here we actually, we see the, uh, the other way around. We see actually more, the JSI is less suppressed at uh, at the LHC compared to RIC. So that's mainly because at the LHC, you have more and more uh, charm and anti-charms, uh, charm quarks flying in the, in the system, you have more regeneration effect as I er mentioned earlier. So this kind of this, uh, difference we see here is because you have a smaller regeneration contribution uh, at RIC. As you go to high APT, where the regeneration also becomes insignificant, here this is the comparison of the high PT JSI uh, for uh, star shown as red and uh, CMS shown as uh, blue. Here you can see, um, even though the uh, the effect or the significance is not so large, but here you can see the star data points are consist consistent above the CMS data points. This is kind of in line with our expectation that, sorry, uh, that uh, your you have a, a hotter medium, so you have a more uh, suppression uh, at at the LHC. So then we can also compare uh, our results to uh, to the models. So on the left hand side, this is at low PT. Uh, so we have two different models: uh, the uh, transponder model from Tsinghua and TexAM, so as the um, magenta and the black curve here. So you can see both of them agree with data reasonably well. And we also have a statistical hydronization model, which uh, they have a very different idea, meaning that uh, there is no JSI at all, essentially. So all the uh, charm quarks uh, uh, are in, all, all the JSI melted at the very beginning and recreated at, at the very end when the hydronization happens in, in the medium, along with the other hadrons. So this particular uh, statistical hydronization, they don't really have any cold nuclear matter effect. That's why the RA goes to one at uh, peripheral events. That's why it's actually above data. So, so the, there is a clear kind of uh, uh, cold nuclear matter effect shown in data. But in the central case, they also seem to agree with, with data reasonably well. Uh, at high PT, and uh, again, so now you can see the uh, Texas AM model calculation show as black and the Tsinghua model calculation show as magenta. And data seems to be in between of that. I think there's probably more kind of tuning are needed uh, for both models. I think I'm already uh, quite low in time. So I will skip uh, the uh, this part. I will just um, go to the Opstone. Then I think we can um, uh, discuss uh, and take questions. So this is uh, the latest measurement of the Opstone uh, from, uh, from from star. So the, on the left-hand side, this is the Opstone RAA as a function of centrality. The red is Opstone YS. And the blue is the Upsilon 2S. So in this right-hand side here, you can see that this is uh, kind of the combined centrality, 0 to 6%. We, we also have one Upsilon 1S here as red, 2S. And then we have the upper uh, limit for Upsilon 3S because we don't really see any clear signal. We can only put the upper limit. What we can see here is all the three uh, Upsilon states are suppressed. And there seems a hint of uh, increasing suppression uh, from peripheral to central, even though for the Upsilon OS is probably less so. And uh, this is like a separate measurement of the three Upsilon states at RIC. This is the first time we can do this. And uh, if you compare Upsilon OS and the 3S, there is a more than three sigma separation, uh, which clearly means that uh, the Upsilon 3S is much more suppressed compared to Upsilon OS. And for the 2S, uh, within, I mean, it, 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 its value is between 1s and 3s, but the error is still quite a big. And uh, so it's, it's not so as significant as the difference between 1s and 3s. 
And also we can compare uh, the, uh, our results uh, from RIC to the LHC. So in the upper panel, this is optional YSRAA uh, within star show at the red and the CMS show as open black here. And at the function strategy, here's also quite interesting. We see a similar level of suppression at the RIC and, and the LHC. And even though the error bar is big, but nevertheless, I think this might be because the suppression we see here is mainly from the uh, suppression of the excited states that fit down to the optional wise, as I uh, mentioned earlier, when we interpret, say, the ground state like optional wires or JSI, you need to take into account the, uh, the reduced feed down from the excited states because they are more suppressed compared to the, uh, the ground state in the QGP. And also there is also cold nuclear matter effect. So maybe that's uh, the, or the directly or prim primordial op uh, optional wires itself are not significantly suppressed at, at, RIC, uh, at 200 GeV and 5 TeV. So that's, of course, we probably we need a much better precision on, especially on the star or the RIC measurement to, 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 to be able to kind of make a more firm conclusion here. And if you also compare the Opson 2S and the star measurement is red and the CMS measurement as black here, there seems a little bit hint in semi-central collision that the star, as star is less suppressed and, and, and compared to the LC. Again, I think the, here the precision is not good enough. There's, uh, we, can only, we can only see this is the hint. We can uh, compare to different models. For example, there are two model comparison. One is the transport model, uh, so which is shown as kind of the uh, more kind of hatched uh, line for the red at 200 GeV, black at a 5 TeV. This is uh, the more hatched here. And we all have the open quantum system, uh, uh, um, open quantum system calculation show also as kind of uh, less dense hatched uh, uh, band here. You can see that if you just compare the red and the blue, uh, sorry, red and the black here, you can, seems like there, there is a, a kind of clear suppression in the model that uh, you should be less suppressed at the, at the, at the RIC uh, for a YS. But um, again, so I think the results are still consistent, but it seems like the, uh, the difference in the YS, it seems to be smaller. We see in data compared to what the model predicts. And then also on 2S, it all seems to be uh, uh, quite consistent with data. We also looked at um, the PT dependence. This is the optional YS RA at the function PT. So uh, for on the top and optional 2S RA at the function PT on the bottom, here yeah, we, we don't see a clear optional, uh, the PT dependence, which is quite similar to what we saw in JSI. Again, this could be uh, kind of uh, the, the interplay of many different effects like cold nuclear matter effect or the, or the regeneration effects. We also compare to different models and uh, two of them I already introduced like transporter model and open quantum system model. They also seem to uh, agree with data reasonably well within uncertainty. And then we also, we, here we also committed the so-called the, the Heidelberg model, which is shown as a solid line here. And um, so here this is uh, clearly above data. And one of the reasons it does not have a cold nuclear matter effect, which should have pushed it down. Also, maybe the, the QGB temperature is too high, too low, sorry. The suppression level is not enough uh, in this particular model. So I just want to summarize. So in the P-gold collisions, uh, we saw a sizable suppression for low PT JSA and Upsilon. Uh, this needs to be taken into account when interpreting the, the measurement in AA collisions. And uh, for AA collisions, what we saw is we see high PT JSI are so strongly suppressed. In central collision, this is a clear signal of the dissociation. We see that the ground and excited optional states exhibit, exhibit different level of suppression, which is the sequential suppression signal we are looking for. And all of this seems to all great. I mean, this is also kind of in line with our expectation. Of course, we can also compare RIC and, and the LHC measurement to place very stringent constraint on model calculations. But of course, then, as I said earlier, there are so many other effects going on and I'll list some of them here, like a cold nuclear matter effect, like feed down, regeneration, things like that. I think to really kind of, I think that, that's why I think the, the kind of the field is slightly moving away from using the quaconium as a thermometer because it, it's really hard to directly read off the medium temperature, even though all these effects, I think they still have some kind of connection to the temperature, but some of the indirect connection. And also and research, and also people start to realize that actually maybe quaconium is a good source to look at how the QG, QG, QCD force is modified in, in the medium. For example, there is a potential uh, between the charm and anti-charm or bottom and anti-bottom when holding the quaconium together, how this kind of the potential is formed or screened or changed 
in in the in the in the QGP, which is I think is another kind of interesting topic to to uh, people start to try to draw any some conclusions from the quaternion measurements. So I just want to briefly look into the future. I think starting uh, maybe I can skip this one. So in 2023 and 2025, so we plan to um, uh, take peak gold data in 2024. From there, we can have improved measurement on the JSI and the Opstone cold nuclear effect. And in 2023 and 2025, uh, we plan to take a large statistics gold gold data set at 200 GV is much larger than what we had before. Here we can, especially we can measure JSI V2, especially a low PT. We can also measure JSI V1 for the first time and all maybe even JSI spin alignment, which is a very hot topic recently about a vector meson uh, spin alignment in the QGP. And of course, we can also uh, measure, improve that oops, no suppression. As I said multiple times earlier, I mean, a lot of conclusions are uh, need a more precision to, to, I think, to be more conclusive. And I think one kind of unique thing about STAR is that we have both the electron and the muon channel, which are complementary to each other at both end of mid rapidity. We can kind of cross check each other because of the, the analysis method and the system, systematic, system, systematics are very different from each other. So I think we are looking for a, looking at a very uh, kind of promising future in the next few years for the Quaconium um, um, program at STAR. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rong Rong, uh, for this very nice and comprehensive overview from STAR. So now the floor is open for discussions. So you can either raise your hand or unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, yeah, I see one raised hand, Soman. Yeah, I, it would be good if you show that flow, uh, JSI flow slide that you skipped. And there was oh, another okay. question I had. Uh, so Upsilon, uh, you don't have uh, RA versus PT, is it? Uh, so we do. So maybe, so this is RA versus the PT. Okay. Can you see this? Uh, this yeah. is Y is RA versus the PT. This is Upsilon 2S. That for zero to, uh, zero to 60%. That's the kind of only thing we can do at this point. Okay, so so uh, I so this flat data for JSI PT distribution you explained by saying uh, it's a combination of uh, less suppression for uh, dissociation and uh, more suppression from regeneration, right? So yeah, so here I think you expect, for example. Uh, the regeneration will increase your uh, kind of uh, uh, yield at low PT, while this cold nuclear matter can also kind of can decrease, right? And the dissociation should also expectly should give you a slight rising trend. So I think this is a little bit complicated. I think if you look at the model calculation, show for example the Texas A M model calculation show at the black here, it seems to agree with data quite well. They take into account all these different effects. So, so if this expansion is correct, and if I ex do not expect uh, regeneration for upsilon, then uh, should I expect uh, a rising trend with PT for upsilon when you get so, your error bars reduced? Or what is the expectation for upsilon PT distribution? I mean, there is a rising trend uh, I can see, but. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you look at model calculation, they're actually quite flat. If you look at the LHC, they're also quite flat, I think, for the upsilon. So maybe, I, I don't know. So there, I think there's, um, I think my understanding is, I think that for the optional, even though there's no kind of, uh, uh, like not so many BB bar in the, in the medium, but there could be like, a uh, say uh, oops, no, why is dissociated into a BB bar? And these BB bar are not so far away from each other and they, they can read, this correlated the recombination or the correlated regeneration maybe also change the PT distribution of the of the upstones, I think. So because if you look at all these kind of model distributions, again, I agree. I mean, data we can we should do better, but the, if you look at model distribution, they also don't have much of a PT dependence. 
Yeah, I'm a little confused by this, but fine. Uh, so, so you are going to show the flow thing when I ask the second question. So maybe you can. Show. Yeah. Yeah, maybe the flow. I think it's so. I don't think we need to go through the uh, the motivation. I maybe I just show the results to see what we measure the V two as a function P T for the isobar at uh, from low P T and high P T. So especially at low, the high P T error, of course, is large, and low P T can see the V two is almost zero. That just either could means that your regeneration contribution is small, or even, even if you have some regeneration, the charm is not thermalized or does not flow much in the medium. So they also have a small contribution to the V2. But the gold gold, I think the situation is a little bit different because the error bar is a bit bigger. And that's why in 2023 and 2025, we have much more statistics and we expect to see, to make a much uh, kind of uh, much precise measurement because at a 200 GV gold gold, from the D0 measurement, we know the, the charm seems to flow. And then we also know that uh, we should have a, sub, uh, a, a sizable contribution from regeneration. So expect to see some final V2 at low PT. I think we, need, we will see if that really the case with uh, the 23 and 25 data. Thank you. Okay, so uh, Rishi. Yeah, hi, Ronan. So uh, actually, there I had one quick question uh, on slide 29. Uh, the difference between the Alice and CMS is just the PT cutoff. Uh, okay. Which one, left and right? Yeah, between the left and right, yeah. Yeah, that's only the PT cutoff, yes. Oh, one okay. low PT, one the higher PT, yeah. And uh, the statement is that uh, at high PT, uh, regeneration effects are uh, not substantial. So then RIC and LSC seem to be comparable, but at low PT, uh, uh, these effects are substantial. So uh, LSC is higher. It's higher, yeah. Yeah. Okay, and, but the, okay, uh, right. Okay, this seems fine. Uh, then one more question was related to the comment that you were making to Somin. Uh, you said that uh, V2, uh, the charm, I mean, you know that charm flows and regeneration is substantial, but uh, regeneration at uh, risk uh, is expected to be not such an important effect, right? So then... It could be that V2 uh, that you measure at RIC is much closer to zero, although at Alice we do see substantial V2 for JSI. Yes, I think it's it's a matter of, uh, it's a quantitative uh, statement, I think. I, I mean, at the, at the LHC, we know the regeneration is much more significant compared to RIC, but I think from, for example, at least like a rough, rough about, um, Rough model calculation at RIC, the surviving JSI, about half of them are from regeneration. So if that's the case, we might we may also see some V2 signal. And uh, we, we I think that we mm -hmm. really need more precision to see that. Maybe at the LC, I don't know, maybe 80 or 90% of them are regenerated. Ah, right? uh, I see. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh... And Debashish. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, wrong, wrong. Thanks yeah, for I can hear you. Thanks for the very nice talk. Actually, uh, it has come a long way uh, since Quark Matter 2008, when I had the privilege to show the first results from Rick. And uh, having involved uh, in both in Alice and LHC, I have a bit confusing thing in your, one of your slides where you said that both 1S is almost falling in the same line with L L LHC and uh, uh, RIC. So have you checked with other systems? For example, uranium, uranium, do you have results uh, for its analysis there? So yeah, we have the uranium results published, but the error bar is large. It's, uh, it's much larger the error bar compared to what we have here. So it's, it's, it's much less, I mean, it, it, it's hard to say. I also, I said, I think our error bar is still also large. We have a 20% error bar on the PP reference. And hopefully with the 
for example, run 24 PP data, we can reduce this, uh, this error bar. Okay, and because one hand, when we are cleaning at a much more hotter system at LHC, uh, when the good surrounds uh, trying to uh, be a sort of a standard candle now for this uh, temperature, this is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to make a statement that we probably see a same suppression is what I hear is about. Yeah, I see what you mean, but I think it's not so clear to me, for example, the optional YS itself is suppressed or significantly suppressed even at the LC, right? Do we have like uh, evidence of that? No, I mean, when you measure optional on YS, right, you also have the, all these feet down contributions and they are strongly suppressed. We all know that. And also you have a cold nuclear matter effect. So if you take all of those into account, we, I mean, does this, do we still see like a large suppression for the optional wires? I'm not so sure. No, no, I'm not saying, I'm saying that the quantitative estimate of both falling in the same line is a little bit, uh, I know, I mean, there are other players, who, as you have said about CNM, once you say CNM, uh, we actually don't know how to decouple them. It's easier in the models, but hard in the data. You just cannot subtract mm -hmm. them that way. But, but from the, just from the visible point of view, if both are at the same uh, falling on the top and other, uh, that uh, I'm a little bit concerned that. But why, but then, then at LHC with almost 35 times more energy, uh, what are we at all doing? So, mm -hmm. why does this high temperature stuff go and the top of suppression? So, so, this is what I was feeling. That's what I was thinking that if other systems, or check that trick, then probably there you might have had an idea. Because in LHC, we already had only lead lead, and of course, some xenon xenon, but that's very small data. So, yeah, we, we, we actually, we are, uh, we actually, we are, I think we very quickly we will release the optional in, in uh, isobar, uh, ruthenium and zirconium, but uh, the error is big. Mm -hmm. I so, I think this we will have more. Uh, or even better measurement in 23 and 24 or 25 from both STAR and S Phoenix. Yes, yes, S Phoenix. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. That's all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Enrico, please. Yes, uh, hello, uh, hello, Gong Gong. Uh, thanks. It, hey, it, it, Enrico. Hi, it was a very nice talk. Uh, I wanted to ask you still something on the matter of the of the JPS suppression at low PT in, uh, in nuclear collisions because no, apparently you told us okay this is a, a difficult region in the sense that there are three main effects so there is uh, the cold nuclear matter effects then you may have additional hot matter effects uh, suppression. And then uh, you have on top of that also uh, recombination uh, usually in these. Uh, um, in this model calculation, one has, uh, let's say, the, the global effect. Uh, so I, I was curious to, to, to see, uh, to see, or, or uh, to, to know if, uh, let's say, based on, on this data and on the model, uh, are, are these data showing, uh, uh, let's say, that, that indeed a, a regeneration mechanism is necessary to, to explain the data? So uh, how large is this for, for, for this data? If you remember or know it, yeah. uh, so uh, so for the ten, for, I only remember for the uh, okay. Let me put this way. so for both for this transport model for both Tsinghua and Texas AM, I think they both of them have regeneration. Uh, I can't remember for the Tsinghua uh, Tsinghua model. I can't remember how fraction uh, what's a fraction for the Texas AM. I think it's about fifty percent of the JSI coming from uh, at low PT coming from the regeneration. And uh, so I think both of them take all these kind of effects into account. I think the question is whether if you say you don't have any regeneration, you just, I'm not so sure because I think for example, cold nuclear matter effects exist for the text aim. I think they kind of try to use the P gold and the D gold result to gauge the cold nuclear matter effect. And then, yeah, so I think that's, I'm not so sure if they completely turn off the regeneration that that can you still measure uh, or describe data. 
that I'm not so sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. No, it might be interesting, let's say, for one of those, for example, for the central to have uh, from from the models uh, the, the 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 two contributions, let's say, shown uh, separately, so that the one uh, may uh, yeah may judge. But okay, uh, yeah. Oh, but I, I see. Okay, Th thank you. Thanks, uh, mm -hmm. Let's see, hello, yeah, please ask your question. Uh, hi, Longo, can you hear me? Hey, Lokesh. Yeah, hey, Lokesh. Yeah, it's a very nice uh, presentation. Can you go to slide 25? I have a naive question there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all these models, I think uh, uh, for the measurement point of view, in future, STAR is going to uh, improve the measurement, right? For this, uh, yeah. for this data. Hopefully. Hopefully, with um, it depends on how much data we will take. We will have in twenty twenty four. I think <laughs> you all know the yeah. discussion. Yeah. Yeah, but what about models? I mean, they have also a big error. So, uh, is it uh, possible or for them to also reduce these bands? Or, I mean, what is the scenario there? Yeah. So this is. Um, I think most of these bands are coming from the uh, uh, uncertainty on the uh, PDF, right? I mean. With all the, the more and more measurement from Rick and the LC, I I would think they can they can reduce uh, they can reduce their uncertainties. I mean, but of course, I think the the thing is that we need a very precise measurements. I think that's the uh, uh, one of the issues here. I can see we have we still have this kind of a global uncertainty here, and we all all the data points always have the uncertainty. I think, think they can. I think. In, I mean, with all the new and new measurement and more precise measurement from Rick and the LC. I, at least I hope they <laughs> be able to reduce these error bars, yes. Okay. So another uh, naive question I have about this MTD acceptance. So this is uh, due to uh, less modules or, or why, I mean, this acceptance is less for, for MTD? Yeah, so... Okay, maybe which one is better to show? Maybe this one. I mean, the length of the uh, the magnets is fixed, right? As you get away, more away and away from the, uh, uh, for example, from the center, your 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 rapidity except as uh, shrinks, right? Mm -hmm. That yeah, and for the five direction, so that's why we only have about half of the rapidity coverage in Ada. In the phi, uh, there are a few things. Mm -hmm. One is there are the gaps, right? So uh, the gap is almost like a half of the uh, half size of the module. And we also have a few places we, we cannot install anything. And then we on the bottom, we can only install three instead of five modules because all of these are because kind of uh, physical constraints. That's why the acceptance of the MTD is actually much smaller compared to the uh, uh, BMC. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So, <clears throat> any other questions for Rongrong? 